Are you ready to get serious about building content sites and building a profitable business online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online asset. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. Let's do this. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Website Builder podcast and YouTube channel. This week, I've got an awesome guest with us. His name is Richmond Howard. He's actually been a client of Niche Website Builders uh, for around a year now. Um, but today, we're going to talk about one of his websites. It's grown exponentially over the last uh, 16 months since he, since he started it. it. In January, it crossed 140,000 visitors, and he did for over $5,000 in revenue. So we're going to talk about how he's done that. Uh, we're going to talk about why he doesn't use social media marketing. It's all just SEO traffic. And also any lessons that he's learned and things that he would do differently uh, for his next project. Uh, so let's get into it. This episode is brought to you by Niche Website Builders, an agency dedicated to helping people just like you build profitable content sites. Niche Website Builders are the hands-off content site marketing agency you always wished existed. It's run by content site marketers for content site marketers, and they help both investors and individuals alike build profitable online properties. They provide a fully outsourced approach to content creation, link building, and done-for-you website builds, the same approach they use on their own six-figure portfolios. For example, their content packages come with a proprietary keyword research process, are written by in-house native English speakers, formatted using templates proven to convert, and uploaded to WordPress with affiliate links added so that all you need to do is hit the publish button. Check them out at nichewebsite.builders/show. That's nichewebsite.builders/show and fill out the form to get coupon codes for 10% more content or a 10% discount on links with your first order sent right to your inbox. Hi Richmond, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm not too bad. Not too bad in in very dark and dingy Wales. Where, where about you? Uh, I am down in Houston, Texas. What it's a, it is also dark and dingy. But where the food is good, right? You sent me some photos food. of the amazing food you cook. The food is great. Yeah, a lot of barbecue down here. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of tech mix. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, thanks for being on the show. It's great to have you. Um, I think yeah. yeah, man, I'm excited. Excited to be here. Good, good. I mean, tell us a little bit about, about yourself, kind of away from before we get into the, the online marketing stuff. Um, give us a bit of background about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I am um, 27, married, uh, have our first kid on the way. And so our uh, first baby will be born here in about five or six weeks. So I'm getting ready for a lot of sleepless light nights. And um, other than that, I, uh, I work full time uh, in ministry. So I'm a, I'm a pastor at a church and have been for the last five years. I am also in grad school, uh, getting a master's in theology and have been doing that for the last five years. And so um, those are kind of my life passions. What I care most about is ministry and family. Um, but the uh, the online business stuff has been kind of a side project that long-term will help fuel both of those two kind of passions. And um, that's kind of, where, kind of where a lot of that started, um, was just wanting to free myself up to do ministry, to make income on the side, knowing that my day job doesn't have a lot of potential for that. Um, well, also, you know, caring for a family well. And so that's kind of why I got into online business. Um, but hobbies, I like to barbecue. I like to work out, like to read, um, and like to blog, I like to run websites. So it started off as a hobby and now it's a full scale business. That's awesome, man. You're, you're a busy guy. So you've got a full-time job. You've got a family on the way. You're doing your master's in, uh, you're doing your master's and, and, and you're also running a successful full website portfolio, which is, I mean, how do you fit that in? It's, it sounds so busy. I, I, I don't sleep a whole lot, uh, so I'll be I'll be used to that whenever the whenever the baby gets here. Um, yeah. I don't sleep a lot. Super productive. A lot of early mornings. I say no to a lot of things. Yeah. And I somehow make it all work. Don't even know how. Some days. 
That's so awesome. I, I, mean, I outsource a lot, which we'll get into. <laughs> but. Yeah, I suppose you have to with, with that all that going on. Yeah. Yeah. How, so I, I know you you started your site back in in 2019. The site we're going to talk get into a little bit more detail later on. But I think you've been doing some some stuff online before that. Um, do you remember like when you started and how you made your your first dollar online? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I started in October of 2017. Uh, I had um, long story short, I had been working at a job and hated it. My first six six months out of college, first year out of college. And, um, I, I remember distinctly sitting in my office one day, looking up ways to make money, somehow stumbled across blogging as a way to do that. And went down like the rabbit hole of listening to smart passive income and pro blogger and all like the old, you know, the more old school guys, um, who've been around for a while. And so I, at the same time, um, I was also, I had left that, ended up leaving that job, had started grad school and was making no money. And we were had to be really tight and live on a budget. And so kind of stumbled into the personal finance sphere of blogging and that community. And so ended up starting a personal finance blog called pfgeeks.com. And I, the site is still live. I still own it. I don't really do a lot with it these days. Um, someday maybe I'll, I'll post on there for fun, but um, it does not make any money. It doesn't do anything for me. Um, but that's where I started. And so I, I wrote on that site, started October of 2017 and it took me a while to kind of figure out what I was doing. Um, I had no, no strategy going in. I didn't know what SEO was. I didn't know, I didn't know anything really. Um, I just liked to write about budgeting. And so I wrote about budgeting. Um, it's so about, about a year and a half into that. I had one post that started to take off and do really well. And it was related to meal prepping. Um, so then I wrote a second post on meal prepping that also did really well. And so I had a personal finance site that was getting around, you know, in a, in a good month, around eight to 10,000 visitors, um, all, all related to meal prepping posts. And so none of the, fi the finance content did well. Um, I made my first dollar on that site. I qualified for Mediavine. Um, in one crazy month where all the stars aligned and I hit 25,000 visitors. Um, so then I was able to have ads on the site and made money that way, but it was maybe 200 bucks a month. Um, it was not much. Some months it was like 150 or 75. It was, it was nothing. Traffic was pretty dismal, um, on that site. And then eventually uh, so that's where I, that's where I got started. Eventually decided to transition, um, basically fully into the meal prep niche. And so, that's where I'm definitely building out my online business. That's where I've seen a lot of growth and that's what I'm focusing on. Awesome. Yeah. So I, th I think you started that, that new site focusing on that niche in that area back in September, September, 2019. So it's, it's been about 16 months now and the site's grown in incredibly well. You've, you just crossed 140,000 visitors in January. You just made, I think the first month, um, in January, we, we crossed the five thousand dollar a month mark. Um, what what made you want to kind of take it more seriously in September? Because it sounds like that first site was a good testing ground, and then you started the second site, um, and then you, you you took it seriously from the start. I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. So with with the finance site, I mean, after about a year, I started to get more serious with it. Um, I just wasn't seeing any results, and so I, I was writing out SEO style content. Mm -hmm you know, long, long posts, optimize the whole deal. Um, but it just wasn't doing very well. Um, it wasn't ranking stuff. Wasn't moving up. Um, personal finance is incredibly competitive. So to even compete, you have to have a super high domain authority, um, tons of backlinks coming in and you're competing against big brands with big budgets and deep pockets. And so ended up, ended up still being serious about it at, the, at that time, but jumped into meal prepping because I saw a good opportunity to, based on the keyword of research that I had done, I saw super high volume, super low difficulty, which is like every website, you know, every SEO's dream. And so uh, kind of stumbled into the niche. I had, I had made about $6,000 that year freelancing mm -hmm. for a big personal finance website. And, um, had this six thousand dollars sitting in my bank account. I was thinking I could invest it if I wanted. I could, you know, help it use it for a down payment on our house. But ended up we we wanted to really make an alternative investment. And so 
we had been saving for retirement. We had the down payment ready. So for us, it was like, let's, let's do something creative. Let's do something different. And, um, I decided to basically start a website from scratch called meal prepify. And I moved over the content from meal prepping onto the new site. Um, started from scratch, domain authority of zero, no backlinks, nothing. And, um, really just took that $6,000 and paid like 200 bucks for a logo and branding package and everything else went right into content. And so other than the four posts that I moved over, um, I actually haven't written anything on the site. It's all been outsourced, which I know we'll get into at some point. Um, but it has been, it's been fun. And so really, really just treating it like it's a business, um, like it's an investment. I am constantly thinking about return on investment, ROI, what's the best, where should each dollar go today to get the highest return? Um, and so it's been, it's been a really fun project. Um, yes, yeah, so I started September of 19. It made no money for the first four months. And then it started to make like 10 bucks a month off Amazon. So still pennies. Um, and then eventually in May, I traffic has started to go up. So this is May of 2020 and, uh, qualified for Ezoic, which, and then used them for about eight months. Um, and then as traffic kind of grew, eventually switched to ad thrive after um, a big month in December and January. So as of last week, I am now with ad thrive and loving, loving it. They've been awesome. That's awesome. man! It's such a great story. How you transitioned the, uh, you know, you kind of pivoted from the one site into another site because you saw an opportunity and, and then took it seriously as a business and, and the way you're thinking now, I think is awesome, you know, coming at it from an investment and ROI perspective. Um, yeah, it's great. So what, what do you think has been the big success drivers for this site? How, like what's made it so successful for you? Do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think on one hand it's having that business mindset. So it's that everything I'm doing must have a purpose. Mm -hmm. Like we've said, I am, I work full time. I'm in grad school. I have a wife and, um, I don't have time to like mess around. I don't have time to experiment a whole lot. I want to do what I know works. And so um, for me, it's been a really simple formula of content that is targeting the right blend of, you know, volume difficulty um, and then links. And so I really, all I focus on these days are content and backlinks, content and backlinks. As of a couple months ago, I'm starting to get more into some other aspects of SEO. Like I'm working on site speed. I'm working on Google EAT um, and some of those things. I'm working on, you know, trying to make myself look more authoritative, like a legit website, not just like a, you know, scammy looking affiliate site. Um, so those things like design are starting to matter more to me. But really for the first year, I was militantly focused on getting content on the site and building as many backlinks as I possibly could. I ignored everything on social media. I ignored Pinterest, even though I'm a food blog. I did nothing else other than content and links. And um, and, and it worked, and so um, and it's still working. <laughs> and so uh, that's still 90% of where my time goes. Um, now, thankfully, I've been able to outsource a lot of that, so that's been a big driver for success. Um, with being, being able to outsource a lot of content, being able to outsource editing, being able to outsource some VA work. Um, working with, working with y'all has been a, a game changer, no doubt for the business. Um, and so there's been a mix of outsourcing and then I've been able to outsource all the content yeah. side of things. And then I've been able to focus on link building, which is what I'm, which is what I'm best at. And so, um, T tell us a bit more being about able to really content. dominate a link building has been huge. T tell us a little bit more about the content side of things. What, what was the strategy there and, and how did you sort of how have you come up with what content to add? Um, yeah. And, and also, how, how's your experience been with, with outsourcing everything? I know it's the dream for most people to outsource content and VA work, and yeah. editing, but it, it's a nightmare essentially to manage. What's your experience been and how have you kind of found those people and, and how we find work, working with these different, different people? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it helped that I had, I had freelance, I'd been a freelance writer for a year. Um, so I, I knew what it was like to work for a company, to use content outlines, to follow instructions, to hit the deadline. I knew some of the the things that freelance writers do to shortcut their work, or I know what good work looks like. And so um, the company that I worked for was was amazing. It's called dollarsprout.com. Um, they've been fantastic. I'm still really good friends with the website, the, the guy who runs the site. 
they were doing some insane numbers a couple of years ago, like 200 K a month, um, in revenue. But, um, but so they, they did a really good job setting up their freelancers for success. And so I kind of followed their same model. And so I did all the keyword research. Um, so I really, I had two kinds of content going. I had the affiliate content, which I've only used y'all for. Um, so no one else on my, no one else, I haven't, my freelancers haven't, no one else has written the affiliate content on my site. Um, and then we have all the meal prep content. So, uh, more like, I wouldn't say recipes cause it's not individual recipes, but like really it's, it's, it's roundup posts as is most of it. And so, um, you know, the best, um, cheap meal prep recipes or keto meal prep or vegetarian meal prep. And so. I kind of honed in on, on a good article outline for those site for those, for those posts, I created the outlines and then I hired writers to just really plug and play. And so, uh, I would tell them the main keyword, the secondary keywords, I would make sure it's included in the headings and the intro and the different places. Um, the on-page SEO was, was pretty solid. I wouldn't say it was perfect, but at the time for what I knew, it was definitely well done. Um, and so really nailing that and then hiring, I hired a lot of writers within the personal finance space. Um, people that I, I already knew, I had connections with, I knew they were good writers. I knew they were looking for work. Um, and I knew that they would do a good job. And so I hired, I hired probably three to five different people who over, over time, um, I ended up with, with one who was probably my steady, my steady writer. Yeah. Um, and she did a fantastic job. Um, she's written, a bunch of posts for me that are ranking on page one. A lot of them are number one. Uh, she wrote two guest posts for me, both of which are on page one of Google as well. And so she's just been amazing. Um, she's a little bit more expensive than a content agency, no doubt. Um, but she's done, she's done really good work. And so um, I've used, I used her to really build out a lot of the meal prep related content. And then um, but I'm, but really in this past year, I've mostly focused on affiliate content or, or I guess over the last six to eight months, um, that's where most of my focus has been. And then, um, you know, doing keyword research to kind of hone that in, um, a lot of it was really looking for, you know, low volume or h higher volume, lower difficulty, and then progressively targeting bigger and bigger keywords, um, seeing what my competitors were ranking for, and then writing that same article, but doing a better job. Um, one thing that I've done for my site that I think is unique for food blogs is that they are, they tend to be loaded with images that slow down the, the posts. And so a lot of my, a lot of my posts, they don't have a whole lot of images to try to keep it as fast as possible. And so I think that's also one small thing that has helped me rank better. Um, and then really other than that, other than that, it's been the skyscraper technique, you know, write a bigger article, more value and it'll rank. That's awesome. It's funny you mentioned that about images. Um, I'm actually in a couple of um, food uh, food Facebook groups, and one of the one of the questions I saw in there, or one of the um, pieces of feedback somebody had given someone recently was, every time I go on a like a recipe type of website, it's either really slow to load and I can't get to the the recipe, or I have to scroll past like a million images just to get to the recipe. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that that you you've, you've kind of noticed that and taken it up and. You're not doing yeah. that, which is awesome. Yeah, exactly. So I, I try to keep my introduction as short as possible and yeah. I'll have one big Pinterest style image and then get right into the content. And yeah. so I think that's helped me with, you know, really nailing the search intent, um, helping people get their question answered, find what they're looking for as fast as possible. They're, they're only, and now that I have ads on the site, they're really only seeing one or two ads before they actually get into the content. And so, I think that's helping as well. Whereas typically food sites, you're scrolling for, you're waiting for it to load and then you're scrolling through it all and you're seeing 19 ads before you actually get to what you're looking for. And so I think that's helped yeah. quite a bit. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, I think another another big part of your success has been has been your, your link building strategy, which, um, I mean, we've talked about this kind of off or privately essentially. And you're really good at this. You're really good at yeah. link building. Um, I don't know how you do it. It almost feels a little bit like magic. You kind of come up with all these links. I'm like, how have you even done this? But kind of tell us, or, you know, give us a, not giving away all of your secrets, but give us a high level overview of, of, of how yeah. you do it. How you yeah. 
Yeah, and it's funny because the first, you know, the first six months of me working with y'all, I feel like I was messaging you once a week on Facebook, like, "Hey, just nailed down another forty-five DA link," um, and they were just it was happening every every week almost. And so, I mean, the biggest advantage I had that a new site owner doesn't have is that I had an existing network online, and so um, I can definitely recognize that I had a head start in that sense. Um, the personal finance niche overlaps with food a little bit. And so, you know, every personal finance blogger has a post on how to save money on groceries, how to save money on food, how to eat on a budget, um, ways to, or just a list post of ways to save money. And then within that big mega post, there are specific ways to make save money on food. And so I created a couple of, of posts that were, really linkable from that community. And so I have one post called like cheap meal prep recipes. Um, and it's like 50 recipes you can make for under two bucks a serving. And that post has gotten the the primary, probably the majority of the links of the initial links, because I had all these personal finance friends, these, these people I had connections with. Um, and really it was, it was just a lot of conversations with different people. And I, I was not emailing anyone. I wasn't, you know, there was no cold email. There's no mass outreach. It was, hey man, you know, been following you for a couple of years on on Twitter. We've talked. We've already talked multiple times about stuff. Yeah. Here's this new site I just launched. Here's this. Here's my first pillar article. Man, I, I would I would love if you'd link to it. Um, what can I do in return? I'll share something. I'll I'll you know reciprocate in some way. Um, tell me what I can do. And so, it was just having it was having those conversations. 10 times a week with different people. Um, and so there's a, there's a strategy that um, I think Brennan Hufford came up with it. He's an SEO guy called like the dream 100. And so it was just a list of the, the top 100 places that I want to be featured someday or have blinks from someday. Um, and so I filled that out. And so within from personal finance, productivity, from business to food blogs um, and just started trying to build connections with those hundred people. And so, um, I still got about 40 left to hit up, but a lot of them are bigger. And so I'm going to need some more cred before I do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so really it's just been a lot of, a lot of conversation. And so uh, for me, I've, I have found that uh, cold outreach over email sucks. Um, it's, it, it's a lot harder to get a response. People's, and it feels more like, it feels more business-like, whereas <laughs> Hey, I'm messaging you on Twitter or on Facebook. It, it feels like we're friends, um, and so you know. And even then, like for Twitter and Facebook, you have to like you have to mutually follow each other. <laughs> you know, so there's already some level of like, hey, I'm open to, to talking to you a little bit. Um, and then there's more is more engagement. So typically, I'll I'll share someone's stuff before I try to hit them up. Um, so I'll share an article of theirs. I'll message them. I'll ask them a question, and then. Um, eventually it'll just kind of, uh, lead into conversation around, around blogging. And so one of the things that's been helpful is I'll often talk to people, I'll ask them advice on blogging, um, or we'll talk about strategies or what's working for them, what's working for me, and then end up naturally wanting to help each other, um, with our online businesses. And so the way that I've always, when when, when anyone offers help, I always ask for a backlink, um, whereas others would ask for a share on social media or input on a post or something like that. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think the, the kind of top level takeaway points there are to, to reach out to people, join the communities uh, and just chat to people, basically be a human rather than yeah. an SEO um, trying to get a backlink. And I, I kind of, over the last maybe month or two, I've seen this, I've seen you in action because you we're have in the same groups. <laughs> And it's been great yeah. to watch. I've seen you. I've seen you posting in a couple of groups on Facebook and like offering so much um, value, like advice. It's nothing salesy. You kind of just telling people about your experience and what works for mm-hmm. you. And then I can see the co- like the conversation in the comments where you're right. People are open to to engaging and chatting with you. And I can definitely then see how it would lead on to a, a conversation about how you can help each other. Yeah, it is funny now great. that and it's something that everyone can do. do yeah, absolutely. Um, it is funny that you're now seeing me do this, and I and I know you're watching me um, in these in these food food blog <laughs> groups and stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had one last week. I had one co- I had one comment. I was someone else someone else's post about struggling with SEO, and I made a comment about about how I built a hundred backlinks in my first year, 
so even just even just dropping that line, I ended up having over forty people uh, message me on Facebook, um, wanting to get advice, talk about backlinks, how I did that, and so you know, multiple of those conversations. Uh, really, it was overwhelming. I I haven't responded to half of them. Um, someday maybe I will. <laughs> um, but of the of the ten to fifteen conversations that I had, um, three or four ended up with backlinks to my site. Um, yeah. and it took an hour of work to talk to these 15 people, just hammering away messages in the back. Um, but that's way less effort in the, in the long run than emailing a hundred people for guest posts, writing the guest posts, hoping that the guest posts, you know, stay on their website. Yeah. Um, it was just way more affordable. And I think anyone can do it. If you yeah. act like a human, if you are friendly, if you provide value, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to do that. I think, um, just get in Facebook groups for your niche that are related to blogging and online business and um, interact with people, answer questions, prime in. And I think I think anyone can do that from day one. Do, do you vet the links that you get? Or is it because you're kind of interacting with real people who are building, you know, real businesses and trying to, you know, they're trying to do the same thing that you're doing? I mean, these are these are almost guaranteed not to be like PBNs or spam websites. So do you, do you even vet yeah. them? Or are you kind of just like, oh, well, if there's a link, then I'm going to take it because it's... You know, it should be a good a good site. Yeah, particularly with the personal finance community, I, I took every link I could get. Yeah. Um, I, I knew these people. I knew I mean I, I had read their their net worth updates. I'd read their you know their articles on budgeting, and I knew who they were. Um, I knew that they were real people with real websites with with websites that are kind of built around their personality, and so um, I I just trusted them. Um, and then, you know, I would do some research ahead of time in terms of like, hey, what's their domain authority? And so as I got really when I started, it, I would take any link I could possibly get yeah. as I got towards like a D, like a domain authority of 15 to 20. Like my threshold slowly went up. Um, I wasn't messaging the brand new blogger, I, but I would message people who had been doing it for a year or two who had a domain authority of 20 to 30 um, and just kind of slowly, slowly crept up that ladder um, in terms of who I was interacting with. Um because when you're when you're a brand new site, you're not going to get the biggest guy in your niche to to link to you. Um, but after I after I built up some credibility, after I built up some traffic, after I had some connections, I was able to name drop people, and so I got to guest post for some some pretty big personal finance sites, um, Physician on Fire, Bio Money Matters, um, Good Financial Sense with Jeff Rose. And so each of this each of those sites was a DA of fifty, um, and they were legit guest posts. Um, that done really well, and so I think that's helped quite a bit. That's awesome. No, I think you shared some really insightful tips there. Hopefully, our audience can can find real value in that. One of the, one of the things which I saw you talk about recently, which was which re was quite interesting and surprised me, considering the niche you're in, is first one is that you you didn't really focus anything particularly on design of the site. Um, like the design of the site isn't isn't anything great and you didn't really concentrate too much on the CRO of things. So I know you're, you're looking at that more now, obviously as it, as it becomes a bigger brand. Um, so I guess talk us through that. Like, well, was that a conscious decision not to, to look at design and, and CRO stuff until, until you were further down the line? Yeah, it's a great question. And so again, for me, it comes back to kind of that core, uh, principle for me was what's the high, what's the best return on investment um, for that day, for that week, for that month. And so for the first six months, I knew that, hey, no one is going to be on my website. Um, and if they are, they're going to find me through Google. They're not going to be around for a long time. I'm not trying to build a brand. I'm not trying to get people to come back week after week. I don't have an email list. And so um, for me, it was, hey, the, the site design just has to be minimal. I need to, it need to be fast. I need it to be good enough to not drive people away or be like repulsive or be so old school that it looks terrible whenever I ask people for backlinks, but it did not need to be anything fancy. And so I used, uh, you know, an out of the box WordPress theme, I think from studio press, maybe. So I probably dropped 50 bucks on it. Um, and then I haven't really, I haven't touched the design until about a month or two ago. Um, for me, it was, Hey, the site is growing. It's getting traffic. It's, it continues to grow and get traffic despite the not the not awesome site design, and so um, for me, it's a matter of investment. And so I, you know, I talked to a bunch of people who 
Um, you know, they're they're constantly tweaking things on the site. They're getting new logos, new graphics. They're changing the the format of the headers and the menu, and they're doing custom stuff. And um, they're learning CSS and HTML. And meanwhile, they have a thousand visitors a month. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, look, that, that's your site looks beautiful, but you have no traffic, and so no one is actually seeing your good site design. Um, yeah. Worse for me, it was like I want to get eyeballs on the website first, and so. I completely ignored site design for that reason. Um, you know, if it if it had been hindering my growth, I would have I would have done it earlier, maybe. But yeah. Um, so now that I'm at you know over a hundred thousand visitors, I have the income coming in because um, it was also a matter of income. Like I didn't have time to learn how to do these things, so I could have either paid someone to do it, or I could have put that money into content. And for me, the content was the higher ROI every day of the week. And honestly, I think it still is. And so I, now I'm looking towards doing a full website redesign. Um, but even looking at the cost of it, I'm like, if I put three grand into that versus content, I think content will have a higher return on investment even still. And so, um, but I am starting to try to make it look more visually appealing. Um, honestly, so that it looks more authoritative. Um, so that whenever I, Hey, whenever I message people for a backlink or to be on a podcast or to, um, to try to engage with people. I want to look a little bit more professional, a little bit more well done. Um, but even, you know, in December I had 120,000 page views and only 600 of those were the homepage. Yeah. And so, um, I really, the homepage does not matter for me. Um, and so I, I'm trying to optimize, you know, what does the blog post page itself look like and think through that a little bit. Um, cause that, that's where people are going to actually land. And so, trying to make sure that those are well done, that they load fast, um, that there's not a lot of intrusive stuff on the page. Um, and then really trying to try to nail down kind of CRO. So in, improving my conversion rate on affiliate articles. Um, I actually, I bought another website and rolled it into meal prepify, which we can get into. Um, but it was, a, it was a really great strategy. It ended up being an, an incredible investment for me. The best investment I've probably ever made in my life, maybe. Um, it has just worked perfectly. And so I had a bunch of content that needed a lot of updating. And um, so really having an eye towards, you know, CRO now, because I have a couple hundred articles on the site. And if I can make a 10% increase in conversion rate, well, then that, that does a lot for my income. Um, so now those small tweaks are, are where the highest ROI is. Whereas before it was just, hey, let's just get more content, more content, more content. Um, and now I can pay for all the more content and I can just make some tweaks on the side with the CRO. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. I I think kind of the, for people starting out, that's one thing they quite often get caught up in is like tweaking everything. Everything has to be perfect. They almost get paralyzed by the fear of this doesn't look like 100%. Whereas I think your key takeaway point is it doesn't have to, I mean, get Mm -hmm. people on there, get traffic, get revenue going, and then you can figure that other stuff out later, which, yeah, yeah, which kind of works, right? (laughs) It has for me. Yeah. And and what's funny is like, I, now that I'm more involved in the space and I'm talking to bloggers every week from different niches, I mean, I've seen some sites out there that look horrible, like, like not even, not even average, like they look bad and like I am turned off by them, but then they're still making seven, eight, 10,000 a month. And so it just, it just, it blows my mind because I'm like, well, if you had a good site design, then maybe it'd be better. Um, but they just, they also, they, they know what they're good at. Like, I know I'm good at content. I know I'm good at SEO. And so I'm just going to keep doing that until it doesn't work. Um, or until I have so much cash coming in, I can pay for someone to do the site design. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Awesome. I think you, you kind of mentioned it there, but I want to get into a little bit more about um, about the strategy where you you bought an existing site and then you you merged that in. So you moved all of the content over. You kind of set up all the three hundred ones. Talk us through that from kind of from start to finish. Where did you find the site? Like, how did you evaluate it? And then how did you actually handle the transition, the the, the merging of the sites? Yeah, man, that was um, it was a crazy couple of months, and I, I probably asked you a million questions. And so, thank you, one. You've done far more than just create content for me. Um, you've been like a, a free consultant at times um, that I have used and abused <laughs> with questions. <laughs> uh, and I and I, I have no shame in doing it. I'll message you once. I'll message you again. I'll message you again. So you'll get on Facebook and have, you know, four messages from, from me. <laughs> um, 
and you'll graciously respond. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I you know back in that's great. I love it. I guess yeah, it's probably back in August or September. I think it was August, August of last year, August twenty twenty. I came across Motion Invest by Spencer Haas. It was a fairly new venture at the time for them. It had probably been around for a few months. Um, and so I, I would kind of regularly be out there looking at websites, honestly, mostly to to look for content ideas. And so I would say, hey, this site's making a thousand a month. Let me go look at it. Okay, here's a top ranking article. I'm gonna write. That. I'm gonna write that same article. Um, and so really, it was it was really just research for ideas. But I came across one website on his on Motion Invest that was in the kitchen space. Um, it had it had been it had been hit hard by the May update, uh, but the May Google update, um, to where the income had dropped quite a bit. And I was looking at some of the, like the some of the site. I was plugging into different kind of you know tools, and I realized that the site had a few kind of key issues, but the content overall was doing well, and Google liked it. Um, the site was making at one point twenty five hundred a month. Um, and then 2000 and then 1600 and then all the way down to 600 a month, which is where I bought it at. And so the site had, had really crashed quite a bit from its high. And, um, you know, I, I plugged it into, uh, some site speed tools. The site speed w was horrendous. Um, it was like, you know, 15, it was just like a total F on everything. And so, um, I knew that site speed was, was a big issue for Google at the time. And so I, um, and this site had a domain authority of 13. And so it was super low domain authority, um, not credible, did not have good backlinks, did not have good site speed, had terrible SEO. Um, a lot of the posts were, they were they were ranking, but they still, they weren't long, they weren't thorough, they weren't well optimized. You had headers in the wrong places, the wrong headers, the post would start with two H1s or would have no H1s or H2s and would start with, eight, with H3s and the site was a mess. Some of the products didn't have links to Amazon, right? Or didn't even have any outbound links. Yeah, they yeah. They, they had there were posts that were ranking on page one for a, a keyword that did not have links to Amazon. Um, so they, hey, here's the best, here's the eight best faucets for this, and it would just it would review the eight faucets and would not link anywhere. Um, and it's like that's on page one. Um, and so I ended up uh, really it was a it was, it was a total mess, but it was a mess that was making six hundred a month. And had been making two thousand a month, and so my theory was I can buy the site, I can make some changes and turn it around, flip it, um, get the content where it needs to be, and then actually take all that content and move it onto my higher authority site. And so you know all this content was on a, a site with a DA of thirteen. I was at thirty two, thirty three, so I just moved all of it over. Um, so it was it was a super long process. Um, the first thing I did was so after. Also, I started buying the site through Motion Invest. Um, they, they were great. I highly recommend them. If you want to buy an existing site that's already producing income, they they have found a good niche in the like kind of starter, just out of starter site um, level. And so they they have sites ranging from you know a hundred bucks a month to two thousand a month. And so they're pretty affordable. Um, so this site was making six hundred a month. But the the six month average was around eleven hundred, and so I ended up negotiating down off the list price quite a bit. Uh, I won't say how much, but um, I got a, I got a good deal on it. And um, one, one thing just to cover there, because I, I, I you did something really awesome there, which I think most people kind of don't do when they negotiate on a site. And I, I remember you sent it over to me, and I thought this is great. So rather than just going back with a counter offer, you actually pulled together its. This document basically outlining everything that you thought was, you know, basically um, justifying the valuation, the counter offer that you yeah. got back to them. And I thought that was awesome. So you kind of listed all this stuff out and justified the offer. And I, I, and I think that's super powerful rather than just going back and saying, yeah, here's my counter offer and, you know, walking away. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, so this, this the site owner, may, I, I never met him. I was all, all my interaction was through Motion Invest. They were the, the intermediary. Um, so maybe he knew this stuff, maybe he didn't, but I basically went into Ahrefs and SEM rush and I basically pulled all these different stats on, Hey, this is where traffic used to be. This is where it is now. This is the domain authority. This is where it is now. You added all these backlinks, but it made no difference. Um, and so really it sounds harsh, but like I, I started off like affirming like, Hey, the website looks, it's great in these ways, but then here are all the issues with it. 
and basically kind of left it with, hey, if you don't if you don't sell it, it's going to keep going down unless you want to do all the work in fixing it. I'll buy it from you at this 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 price. Um, I guess I don't mind sharing. It was listed at thirty seven thousand <clears throat> on Mission Invest, and I ended up buying it for twenty and a half or twenty one. And so probably it was like six, basically 60% of the list price is what I got it for. And so it was a multiple of that 600 a month that it was currently making, even though it was, it had been making 1200 a month on average. And so got it for a great deal, um, bought the site. Motion Invest was, was fantastic in terms of being the intermediary and receiving the funds and sending me the site. And they kind of served as the escrow account essentially. And so once I got my hands on the site, um, the first thing I did was just start kind of slowly making tweaks while it was all still on the old website. So I did not immediately bring it all over. I wanted to kind of let it sit a little bit. I wanted to kind of get my bearings on, hey, there's 150 articles. What's worth keeping? What's what's not? Um, and so you know, I started to kind of build some backlinks to the site. I fixed the site speed stuff. Um, sort of making small tweaks and, and traffic was definitely starting to go up. Uh, when I bought it, it was getting around six and a half thousand visitors a month from Google. Um, and then I, I kind of built that up to around 10,000. So it was definitely on a good, good trajectory. And then I started to move content over to meal prepify. And so what I did was I had a, I had a VA um, who has been fantastic and she would basically move the content over update the article for SEO, for link, for thoroughness, for grammar, for, for editing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if the previous site, one of the, one of the previous owners of the site was definitely not native English or the writers he used were not na native English. And so a lot of it needed to be, needed to be edited. And so she basically went through the top 75 posts and moved them all over to, to meal prepify and would do one after another and publish them. And so, um, so really that, that started around December. And so, um, within, within weeks, my site traffic just absolutely took off. Um, so that, that site was making 600 a month. It was, um, getting 10,000 visitors a month from Google. And then when I moved it over to meal prepify that, that content itself, um, was making it. I didn't do all the math to like really get it perfectly accurate, but uh, it was probably making around 2,500 a month once I moved it on to meal prepify. And that's without, that was just moving it over and putting it on a higher domain and watching everything hit page one. Um, I mean, almost every article was on the first page of Google. Um, once I moved it over for the target keyword, a lot of it was in the top three. Um, I've, I have a bunch of featured snippets now. And so, that that took my site traffic um, really through the roof, and so my that month my traffic um, doubled for, for SEO. I went from forty thousand hits to eighty thousand. Uh, I I qualified for Ad Thrive that month, um, and then in January it just took off even more. And so um, this this past month, so December was my first five thousand dollar month. January was as well, um, around fifty five hundred or so, and and had 140,000 visitors from Google. And so in January, I started more focused on the on the CRO. And so making improvements to the, the layout of those pages, the you know, having good product call out boxes um, and trying to optimize for snippets and stuff. And so really seeing a lot of growth there as well. Um, you know, just, just really, really optimizing that content. And so I bought the site for 20,000, it was making 600 a month. That 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 content is probably making twenty five hundred to three thousand now, and so it would be worth closer to you know eighty, ninety, hundred thousand based off what I bought it for, and it's been six months. And really, the, the biggest thing was a lot of improvements, n taking what I know and applying it to this content, but also um, probably just moving it over from a low authority site to a high authority site. Um, probably made one of the biggest differences. Yeah. No, that's great. Just, just a quick question on, on when you moved the posts over, I'm assuming you then set up like 301 redirects from the old site to the new site? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So I would um, I would move all the content over. I would make sure that I had the, the URL how I wanted it, the new, the new URL, because uh, the old ones were kind of either super long or it didn't have the right keyword in it. And so I'd make sure I had the right URL. And then, yeah, just uh, I think 
if you search 301 redirect in plugins, it's like the first one there. And I just use that. And so I set up over 75 redirects from, you know, post to post to post. Um, make sure you test those. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, it worked, it worked like a charm. And so I would three to one redirect it. It would usually take, you know, one or two days. And then it would, you know, if you were to go to Google that, that, that same day that I redirected it and search for something and click on an article, it would still show the old site's name and stuff. But if you click it, it would redirect you to my site. And then um, after a couple of days, meal prep of five would be what would show up in the SERPs. That's awesome. And, and did you did you end up redirecting everything over? Did you redirect like the homepage, the category pages, or were you literally just redirecting each post individually? Uh, I just did individual posts. And so um, I kind of looked through Google Analytics and Search Console and um, and based on based on my site and kind of content I already had. And uh, I moved over probably half of the articles. And so um, 150 posts total on the website. I moved over 75 of them. And the other 75 are still on that website. Um, they're still, it's still live. And so I didn't, I didn't want to redirect everything because I still wanted those 75 articles to sort of have a, a home base as well. Um, and so that site still has a DA of 13. Um, I'm not building links to it. I'm not actively trying to grow it, but um but we'll see, we'll see what happens with it you know it's been it's helpful for for linking to other people for um kind of doing favors that way um mm -hmm. and, and if some of those posts start to move up in rankings i might move them over as well but for now it's just kind of hanging out there awesome so so you've got this this site like now it's it's doing five five and a half thousand a month i'm going to put you on the spot here and it's just a rough but roughly how much do you think you've spent on this site so far in terms of kind of investment because everything's pretty much being outsourced, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, it's a good question. I, I calculated this a couple of weeks ago, but I've also spent a lot of money in the last two weeks. <laughs> and so <laughs> trying to figure that out. Um, and my most recent update, I had spent a total of 35,000. Um, total was that was the total spend on the website. And that includes buying, um, best kitchen guides for 20,000. And so uh, that was obviously the most sizable portion of that. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I spent 20,000 to essentially get an asset that was making two and a half thousand a month Which, yeah. from personal finance background. Like that's an incredible return on investment. <laughs> You're not going to find anything that will return 10% monthly. <laughs> um, right. and so, uh, so yeah, so 35,000 total all in, um, mm -hmm. along the way, the site has made 18,000. And so I would say I'm really out of pocket only about 17,000. Um, so again, out of pocket 17,000 with an asset making over 5,000 a month, um, has been a really, really good deal for me. Um, and so, but even in this past, this past three weeks, I put another, another 15,000 in. <laughs> and so I'm probably now yeah. up to 50,000 all in, uh, in expenses. Mm -hmm. And that, now, that, that was to build out a new site. And so yeah. I, I wrote y'all a couple of good checks this month, uh, for, you know, I took, I, I put another 60,000, I think into meal prepify in terms of, uh, words. So 60,000, uh, words on the site, um, uh, and the new site, um, I'm putting about 75,000 words onto it. And so, the cool thing is once, I mean, really last year, 2020, I was doing maybe six articles a month um, total, probably four or five with you guys, and then one or two of the more informational meal prep content articles. And so, you know, six articles a month, um, and it was growing. It still it grew pretty quickly. But once you get some really serious revenue coming in, you can really crank things up. And so even just yesterday, I went in and y'all added 30 posts onto the website. And I just clicked, clicked publish on every single one. And so, um, yeah, and I, and I could average 30 posts a month this year if I wanted. Um, yeah. and so really once you get revenue coming in, you can really double down on your investment and, uh, see things take off. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I haven't, I haven't taken anything out of the business for myself personally. Um, my wife and I have not seen a, a dime of the income. Um, it is all going back into reinvesting into the website. Um, in hopes that you know, while we could while we could certainly enjoy a few hundred a month, um, it wouldn't it wouldn't change our life. It wouldn't do anything radically for us. But 
a year from now, it could allow her to stay home full time if she wants. It could it could be a, a life a life changer for us. Yeah, for sure. What what, what is the long term plan with the site? Is it to to grow it and keep it for cash flow? Are you eventually going to to sell it? Like what what's the plan for this? What, obviously, this one site. So you're building a portfolio now, but this one main site. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I go back and forth all the time. And so uh, right now I know that there is still so much potential in the niche in the food in the food blog world. Um, I mean, the and you've probably seen this as well, the the amount of different websites out there getting crazy amounts of traffic with low authority. Um, they're just and they're endless. And so it's like every week I find a new site that's got a domain authority of 10 to 15 that's getting 30, 40,000 hits a month. And, and for me, like I see those, those opportunities, like I can write those same articles and most likely outrank that person pretty quickly. And so, um, the site's making, you know, five and a half thousand a month right now, it's on pace in February to do more than that, even mm-hmm. with a shorter month. And so I'm, I have no intent to sell anytime soon um, because I'm confident that this site will be making 10,000 a month by the end of this year. Um, particularly with some of the changes with the, you know, with the call-out boxes, with the CRO, with getting onto Ad Thrive, I've seen a thirty percent jump in revenue from Ezoic, um, which has been awesome. Um, and so I'm pretty confident by the end of the end of this year, it'll be making ten thousand a month cash flowing. And my plan is to take that and just keep investing in different websites, um, either in Meal Prepify to keep growing it further, or to yeah. start start to build out more of a portfolio. Um, so I have no plans to sell it. I think. It, it, it's, it's my baby. And so, um, you know, I, I might, I might build out new sites and sell those someday or buy a site and grow it and flip it. Um, but I imagine that as far as my portfolio goes, meal prep five will probably be in the long term, um, as just yeah. a steady source of income. I know that I built it well. I know it's not built on PBNs or bad links or spammy practices. I know that Google likes the site, um, and will probably like it long term. And so, I think that, you know, in a year or two, it could easily be making ten to fifteen thousand a month and just using that to fund to fund new sites being built and, and sold. And so yeah. um, you know, long term, if, if my whole portfolio was to be making thirty thousand a month, I'd be tempted to sell it um, yeah. for a, a seven figure number. Um, but that's that's probably a few years away uh, at least. And so um, but that that'd be that'd be a pretty cool cool thing to do. Yeah. I mean, that would be a great story to tell people, right? So yeah. All my, all my sites are seven figures. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that'd be that'd be cool. Yeah. So, I mean, we're coming to the end now. Like, wh- what's next for you? You, you talk about you've, you're going to keep growing meal prepify, um, but you've, it sounds like you've got spare cash to invest elsewhere. Well, what's next on on your radar? Yeah, yeah. So I I'm definitely keeping an eye on things. I um, you know, now the site is making five thousand a month. Um, I mean, the cool thing about online business, which most of your listeners know is there's not a lot of costs to maintain a site. Um, I mean, other than the tools, the software, the hosting, um, that's probably all in for me about a hundred a month, 150 maybe. Um, so I'm not paying a lot, everything else on top, everything else besides that is somehow being reinvested into content, SEO links, all the above. And so, um, it is a pretty good amount of kind of monthly cash flow to decide, Hey, what's, Again, what's the best ROI on for this month's revenue that I just brought in? And so, um, and that that changes. Uh, last this past month, I dropped I think nine thousand dollars on with y'all, uh, which is a lot of money uh, on new content, um, a lot of words. And so, um, you know, that was seventy five thousand words on the new site. It mm-hmm. was sixty thousand words on Miller Prepify, and then uh, three. Let's see, fifty thousand words on a brand new project that we're that y'all are helping me kind of get get launched. Um, yeah. So planning to start a site in the kind of the 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 bath water niche, um, if you will. And so um, I have one subcategory within that that I'm planning to really target and dominate, and then from there kind of build out and expand category by category. And so currently looking for an expired domain in that niche or an existing site that's that's producing some revenue that Google are, Google already likes, um, and so definitely planning to start that. I, I started a second site that um, another site that I bought from um, I bought from like a website marketplace, and so 
Um, that side is just now kind of getting started. Uh, I won't share the niche on that one um, just yet because uh, I want to see how it does first. And I think it's I think it's a gold mine in terms of opportunity. Um, so by the you know by the next few months, I'll have really three sites that are um, that are revenue producing. I have some other domains like the finance site, like the kitchen site that is you know that I stripped away of all its good stuff. Um, yeah. But essentially, I'll, my goal is to have three kind of income producing projects by the end of this year. Um, my problem is I see sites being sold all the time and I'm like, I could totally do that. Um, Cause for me, the way I, the way I see it is I can outsource content. I can update content with my VAs and I, I have some systems in place for making a lot of quick changes like, adding a year, embedding YouTube videos, changing the site speed to where I can buy a site and within the first three, the first, the first month, make 20 fixes that will all add up. And then I outsource content with y'all and I do what I do with backlinks. And I feel like I could grow a site in almost any niche at this point. Um, so for me, I'm looking for, and, th and this might be helpful for new, for either for new bloggers or people who are struggling is, um, is, finding a niche that you can actually compete in. And so like, like where the, the bar for success is lower. And so for example, personal finance, if you want to, if you want to get organic traffic and make money in personal finance, your demand authority has to be through the roof, 30, 40, 50 minimum to do well, which means you're having to build hundreds of backlinks to get there. Um, several hundred. Whereas, you know, in the, in the meal prep niche, I was able to start competing by the time I had a domain authority of 19, I was getting 10,000, 20,000 visitors a month. And so, and so for me, I've, I have found a couple of niches that I'm getting into where um, you don't need to have that authoritative of a website to still be the authority on that topic in Google's eyes. And so I came across a site just the other day that um, it's a local, it's like a local site. So it's basically it's helping you explore a city. Um, and th this this one website had a domain authority of six, and an Ahrefs was getting twenty thousand hits a month, um, and Ahrefs is on the low side, so it's probably getting twice that. Um, and so I'm looking for opportunities where hey, I can come in, I can build 10, 20, 50 links over the course of a year, and be the authority authority in that in that topic, um, rather than you know a really competitive niche where I have to build several hundred links to even have a chance. And so I think going for niches that have a low bar for SEO authority is huge. Um, and that's what I'd recommend that everyone does is find some, find other sites that are in the niche doing well with low authority and then target the crap out of everything that they write. <laughs> um, and so uh, if you have money, like I do coming in, I can pay a content agency, you guys to write all that content. And so, um, you know, so I'm, I'm starting a site this month and I'm dropping 75,000 words on it um, from day one. And so yeah. then all I have to do is go out and build 10 to 20 backlinks and the site will probably be producing revenue within the first six months. Um, so that's been my strategy lately is um, low authority niches, double down and really try, try to fly out the gate. Um, and so, you know, meal prepify, I build it from scratch, uh, but it, took a long time to even get Google to recognize me. And so, whereas now I'm looking to buy sites that already, that Google already likes and um, just double down faster. That's awesome. I think that's really great advice. Thanks, Rich Mans. Um So I guess um, there are a couple of things that you you probably want to get out of this this podcast. And, and one of them is to make more connections in the, in the food space. Um, you're, you're always open to making connections there. Where's the best place that people can <laughs> Can reach out and find you is, is that facebook or yeah yeah um the best place to hit me up would be um would probably be facebook i'm in i think y'all have a few facebook groups i'm in all of them and so uh just search for richmond it's a pretty unique name you'll find me um hit, hit adam a message and he'll send you my, my profile you can also email me um at rich at mealprepify.com um, you're welcome to email me. I, I check my email all the time. I get a lot of bad requests from people. Um, but if I if I know it's someone from the the niche website builders community, I will gladly answer and then probably probably connect with you on Facebook. <laughs> and so um, that's where I tend to hang out. Uh, I'm really active on Twitter, but not under Meal Prepify. It's under my personal finance um, social media. 
just because there's a really active community there that I'm a part of. Um, but yeah, I would love to, if people want to guest post, I would love for them to guest post for me. Uh, I have a domain authority of 33 now, um, a Maz DA of 33. Definitely open to guest posts from, from food bloggers, um, from people in the kitchen kind of niche. Um, I have high standards, and so it's going to be a good article. Uh, whatever you write, it'll rank in Google someday, and so um, that's that's my goal. And so I would love would love guest posts. Uh, I'm also willing to write guest posts for people, and so um, but yeah, I would love to connect with people um, who are who are doing this in the in the food niche, and then I'm also open to some other stuff as well. And so um, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we'll include all the links in the in the show notes too. Perfect. So all the links to Richmond stuff you can find in the show notes. But thanks, Richmond. You've been a great guest. I think you've shared some awesome insights there uh, for both people starting out uh, and experienced site owners as well. So I really appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I loved it. Would hope to come back someday. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have you back next year when you're making 10 grand plus. That's, That's right. That's right. You got it. All right. See you, Adam. Awesome. Thanks, Richmond. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're listening to the podcast version of this episode, Please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please rate and review as this will allow us to grow our audience and create more shows like this one. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to be the first to know about any new episodes that we release. Until the next episode, goodbye.